Good morning, everyone. Checking you can hear us well. Good uh, morning to everyone online. Welcome. We were just getting the teams from the tea break, which is a different building, so it might take some time for folks to trickle in. But uh, really well, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. Nice to see you. <laughs> and thanks for, for joining the part one of the DHIS2 for Education session. After lunch, we have another session which focuses more specifically on the SEMIS application, which you might have seen in the plenary session this morning. Um, and for those of you who did not join the plenary session this morning, uh, there is a recording of that, so you can have a look as well. So my name is uh, Sophia Koziakis, and I'm the Education Project Manager for the DHIS2 for Education Project. I work here at the University of Oslo, very education background, not DHIS2, not technical, but I love data now, so thanks DHIS2. Um, and I work with uh, Knut Starding, who is also with the University of Oslo, but lives in upstate New York. And then, of course, we are a big team, I feel, um, of, of uh, folks across the HISP network, as well as Ministries of Education, part of the, the project. So we're not going to take too much time to give you a brief update, but I thought just a little bit of an introduction to what are we trying to do with moving into a new domain, into a new sector. And then we will introduce you to our lovely list of speakers for this morning. We have some in the room and some online, and we'll, who will give you a bit more of a taste of uh, real world use cases which show the flexibility of DHIS2, which we know, but how we can apply that to what is needed in, a, in the education sector, which has ever changing needs and has maybe in the past really been burnt by having systems which are very off the shelf or built from the ground up that cost a lot of money. Um, and aren't really flexible to as we change, as we have new indicators that come in from international, regional level and national level, um, as well as unique use cases that maybe aren't just about the, the regular education management information system, but maybe something connected to how do we get those national examination results out to our, our students and our learners and much more. So I just wanted to start by, 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 by kind of placing this. We are, we are seeing ourselves as... Yes, a uh, 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 project who is trying to reuse and leverage everything that has been done for 30 years, but we really are have got a very strong research uh, stream through us. So we are trying to find out together how we can positively impact information system strengthening for the sector. And really looking again from uh, taking a leaf from health, looking at that decision making all the way down to the subnational level. So we have a very strong research arm within our project. We have two PhD students in the room with us here today. We have uh, Monica Amua and Sidi Ahmed Jalo. And um, we have a, a, a strong team of people who are thinking about uh, big research questions around uh, education management information systems. But really our, our hope is to try and see how we can support countries to locally customize all the tools that they need to fit the changing needs, as I mentioned. And how can we, at the same time as doing that, going down to subnational level, how do we ensure data quality in the education sector and those validation routines? How do we ensure they're in place for a sector who has maybe been quite data poor up until this point? Um, I mentioned already the contribution to broadening the knowledge base about what it means because I think only now in recent years have we started seeing people talking about education data uh, and statistics. ILO, the International Labour Organization, just celebrated their 100 year uh, conference on, on statistics and we just had our very first in the education sector hosted by UIS um, earlier this year. So, you know, we're, we're, I think we're coming a long way and a lot of good work is being done. And then the final point I want to mention here is that our aim through this project is also to ensure local university partnerships. And again, we've taken a leave from, from UIO and the DHS to experience over 30 years. And Sidi Ahmed Jara from the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education in the Gambia um, will talk a little bit more about the launch this year of an EMIS master's program in the Gambia. Uh, I know that many colleagues in Sierra Leone and Senegal before have taken an EMIS uh, degree at a, a lower level in the Gambia many years ago and have been waiting for a master's program to, to top. So there's a really exciting body of work that's being done there. And then to the side, I just wanted to mention, you know, we ha I hope to build more and more partners as we go along, but these are really some of the key partners that we're trying to work with that are supporting us to, to move the the... I keep saying the baby forward, but indeed it is, um, but also to make sure that we're doing it in the right way with the right standards. 
um, because we, we, it takes a village. Very briefly, how we organize ourselves. I mentioned this big research stream. We're still trying to learn. So with, uh, uh, we have a, lo a lot of support from the Global Partnership for Education, the Knowledge and Innovation Exchange, which really is a research arm of a very large donor called the Global Partnership for Education, GPE, for those who don't know. And the, what we try to do is try to find out how do we connect what we're learning at research level with our PhD and master's students focusing on education, on EMIS, but also what are, what are we learning together with ministries of education? So we're trying to find a more kind of formal way of sharing that knowledge in what we're calling a KICS EMIS research uh, uh, learning lab. And we want to meet more regularly so that we can discuss some of the important topics about uh, so that we don't stay an island within ourselves, but also reach out to others. And of course, you know, we, we need to have the education sector in because there are nuances and we need to understand uh, what the standards are, how the education sector works. So we can't work by ourselves as an information systems team. We need to to share across. So we hope to make this a lot more a lot more open as we as we get our ducks in a row in the Kicks EMIS Learning Lab. And then what we try to do is to liaise with the EMIS Innovation Network. And you saw Alfredo present this morning at the plenary session, the SAMIS app. That really is all the learning that we're getting from the, uh, working with ministries and with partners, and then trying to see how we can maybe create something that is generic enough to fit many, many more countries' um, education sector needs. So we haven't got the, 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 the arrow isn't as smooth. We're still working on the arrow, but we are two buckets of work. And we're trying to connect what we're learning with the technical part and making sure that all feeds together. Um, we know that we're working in more than 80 countries in health. DHIS2, for, uh, just DHIS2, just proper, is in many, many countries. For education, we, the aim is not to spread across the whole world, but we're seeing very different kinds of levels of scale. So this is about 11 countries or so that are at different um, at different levels using um, DHIS2 at this point. Some it's just for a specific issue, for a specific level. Others it's national scale. Others it's a pilot. So it's not, um, it's not a complete full pilot scale for all, but we're connecting a lot with other systems. For exa example, Statiduke in Togo does a really good job at what it does. And then DHIS2 can support a little bit on the side to complement with some analysis, for example. So that's just to give you a little bit of a taste of the countries that are starting to, to um, engage with us or, or to rather to implement a DHIS2. And the purple is some, some interest. So with that, it's more important today to actually move us into discussing uh, the different kinds of use cases that we're seeing DHIS2 being used for. So today's speakers are going to give us a little bit of insight into that flexibility. We know that, um, sorry, I'm just getting my notes up a little bit here. Um, we know that DHIS2 is a very, very flexible platform um, that can address many, many different kinds of needs, but it doesn't need to be the only system that works in any country. So I think we'll also see a little bit today of how we connect with others or um, uh, approaches that we have to, to complement. So for our first presentation, I'm really, really, really honored to introduce you all to Dennis Miles Odong. Um, he is a head teacher and as well as a data focal point from the district of Gulu City in Uganda. And you'll hear from Dennis how a district of excellence has been established in Gulu City and perspectives from Miles and, and from your colleagues about how, how having more access to data um, has helped you and your colleagues to respond to the everyday needs that you, that you have um, a, a, as a head teacher. Then we will move to hear from Sidi Ahmed Jalom. Who works? Who is a systems analyst at the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education in the Gambia, and and who have really been pioneering a shift from aggregate numerical numbers, numbers, numbers to individual level data. What does that mean? What are the processes, the routines, um, and what do we need to to move us into that space? Um, CD is also a PhD candidate who contributes greatly to our daily thinking about how to approach the shift within the sector. So we really value him for that. Um, then we're going to move to hearing from Mr. Dometo, Mr. Dometo from the Ministry of Education in Togo, as well as uh, Jerry Aziawa from his uh, uh, Western Central Africa. And they'll show us a little bit more about how just-in-time innovations such as the WhatsApp bot are being used for sending national examination results in Togo and meeting the needs of, of parents and, and learners. 
And then finally, to end us off for today, we're also very honored to have uh, uh, Amalie Gangnon from the UNESCO International Institute for Educational Planning. Uh, she is a demographer by trade and a program specialist and lead for the data and evidence team at, at uh, IIEP. And she'll share the um, work being done on connecting EMIS with national norms, policy objectives, spatial and climate data to feed into a very exciting multi-criteria decision analysis tool. So I think I will not come up and introduce everyone. We'll just try to do a, a nice run of show. So please uh, help me in welcoming Dennis to the, to the stage or to the front. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I've been given this opportunity. I'm going to present on the data use case in Gulu City, which is in Uganda. I'm going to share you a story. And uh, it has been a great move. And it has be inspired me. Uh, as you say, they have uh, have been uh, a supporting team in that as a head teacher. So uh, let us move on. Uh, for the introduction, Gulu City is a central uh, commercial and social uh, cultural center in northern Uganda. Uh, Actually, it is for around 10 districts, which are, are within the northern uh, district in a Choli sub-region. With that, uh, kilometers to our capital city, Kampala, for you to take on the northern side of the equator. Its land coverage is 225.64 uh, square kilometers. It has only two administrative centers where we have La Ropeche Division and then Badeke Laibi. Uh, this one came uh, when uh, Gulu attained its status to become a city in 2020, whereby this initiative of uh, DSIS2 was uh, one year before uh, Gulu City came in. It was a municipality. It has that population of uh, uh, 271,000 uh, with the, the female and the male in that category. So beside there, that is the map with the division, which are there. Uh, actually, the size of Gulu City is uh, uh, five times the, the former municipality. It has grown big and bigger. When we looked at this prior to DSI 2, the department or Gulu City used to go a lot, whereby when someone just called the name that I need data, there was really a darkness everywhere. You see people disappearing because how to begin and where to get it. So in that, it takes you a long time, a week, even month for you to get your data to use. So you see that, that gap which is there. Looking at that in 2019, there was light. When, yeah, there was light when uh, DSIS2 came in with the help of his Uganda, when you need your data, you just go on a click and the data is there for you. So it has been so much of which right now as I speak, we're in light, no more darkness. Um, we have gone so far with uh, his Uganda, you see that the tools we are using fits 
whatever indicators we need. Customization has been on and on and on. We used to have the annual data uh, form, census form that we normally fill our form on annual basis. But we sat down, we said, no, there are other indicators that we need it on timely basis. How can we wait at the end of the what? Of the year, then we come in. So customization has been on, especially on the pre-primary and the primary section of this, of which by that, we happen to come out, this is our latest uh, version of our uh, data tools that we have on the paper form for collecting our data with the different indicators and the terms that we need. So this is not just in a day. So in 2019, we have been going through those transitions to have this one and still yet. If we are not yet satisfied with this, we can still make adjust adjustment. Ladies and gentlemen, the implementation process has been done. As today I present you the data use cases, a lot has been going on in terms of the implementation. One, we had stakeholders engagement whereby his Uganda and Ministry of Education carry out uh, the data uh, orientations to the personnel in the education department, and then as well as the administrative uh, setup of Gulu City, like the cow, uh, the planner, and then inspector of school, and even the extra, or which are one of them in that. Secondly, we had also capacity building uh, for the city team, uh, like the biostats, the planner, uh, the volunteers, we have other staff which are there volunteering, and even we have uh, those who come for internship, we also uh, we are given this training so that they have to support uh, this running. Uh, another thing is, you know, equipment is needed. So the East Uganda has come in and Ministry of Education to equip the department with those Initially, when uh, I started my introduction, we used to, to have paper form, whereby the storage itself can make you also uh, run away from it to get. But now we have our, uh, the gadgets are there, ready, the internet connectivities are okay. And then we have our printers to give out the feedback. After we have entered our data, we have to give the feedback in time by printing it out and then as well as making the display for those who would like to use. And the storage cabin are there, well set, whatever we need, the paper form to compare, whatever we have in the system are there. So those are uh, the good implementation uh, process that we have. We had also, it's like once you have eaten food, uh, you have to also sit and also say, was the food nice? Was the food like this? So there was a check-in support supervision on site, which were done by our His Uganda and Ministry of Education, uh, which was so much helpful. And some of the team from Oslo, uh, they went there uh, to, to give us the support. And it was very, very productive to bridge the gaps that we have, especially in reporting and the data use. Another one is uh, refresher training. You know, we in that state, we had a lot of gaps which are there we need to. So we say, no, after your uh, support supervision, there's gap, what can we do? We need more training and training. You know, education as a public good is going into innovations. Technology is coming out to take up. So people down there, they are still, especially in my area, they still don't know much about technology in education. So this training was needed, especially the eight teachers, whereby the basic data come from them. And then also we see that if we train them up, they will have time to, to also use this, these uh, gadgets well and give us the feedback that we need in order to run. So uh, the last one is 
user support. We have, we have created WhatsApp for the group, especially for the editors. We have it also for the team, for the S2 team with his Uganda, coordinating the editors to also carry out on-site supervision and also support online where there's need. So the group has been there to help and it has been helpful so much to move. That's why today we came out with this. Ladies and gentlemen, let us go to the core of what I have come to do. The implementation has been done. It's like planting the trees, watering it, looking after it. Now, what about now the fruits? How would you enjoy? So we are looking at this. One, I must say that budget and planning is a core. I'm happy that I'm the focal person also in education department in, in planning because of the data uh, system that I, I worked on. I sit with them. So we have seen that this one does not only end at the district level, also at the school level. So we have uh, learners, enrollment, and teachers data for indicative planning figure. On a yearly, on a yearly basis, uh, the government normally comes out, especially on the, uh, at the site of the government school, that we have to give enrollment of the learners. And those enrollment are used to compute grants and also are used to compute uh, development grant basing on the statistic you are given. If you don't give your statistic, you miss the grant. So we have this uh, system helping us to ensure that we meet this obligation of planning for the education department. Secondly, we have, the, we have been having national assessment, which is run uh, by USMIT, Uganda, uh, USMIT, that is uh, Uganda Support Municipal Infrastructure Development, which of which there are these indicators which we normally generate from the system and they normally assess us on it. And we also see what are the, uh, the, the system that you use to manage your data and what is the evidence they normally would like you to produce. With this, we managed to be the best for almost uh, the three years that we have been uh, from other departments. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are there. We would like to keep on winning and winning and winning. The next one is uh, the school status report. This one has helped so much. One, to generate the school improvement plan and community engagement. Because in, we have the indicators as you see there, especially like uh, the attendance. If there's any gap, you see the number of those learners who are missing school, basing on that, the school feeding program is also there. It also track how many learners are feeding and if there are few, what should you do? So this will help the, the school to bring uh, the parents in their meetings so that to address that issue, so that learners can have their learning well. On to that, it has given us a room to also share with others, other districts which are there on our data management and dissemination and use by those districts like Kabale, Soroti, Oima, and Kumi, among others. So when they come to visit us, they want to see the good practices that we have. And we have it on evidence base because data speaks by itself. Uh, when we looked at this, we have also used this one. We have trained some of the teachers, head teachers who are so much involved to make sure their data are in the system. They use their data to become the data champion as an example to others so that they are driven. They are motivated to come in. Because if you see your colleagues is doing well, why not me? So we use our individual among us so that they encourage others to train them on that. And as well as this one helps also to monitor our colleagues because we attach them to monitor others how they are performing and help where need to be. The training also help has to 
to make sure that those uh, reports, the status report, are well interpreted. Because if I give you the report like that and you don't know, you may not easily use it. So we have to go down and make sure we get into the interpretation of this school status report. Even the dashboard, the school do have their account and they open, they have the dashboard with those reports. Therefore, we need to also give them that uh, so that they are uh, interpreted well. We have other use cases like immunization. This is a, a, a cross-cutting section whereby the health department also rely on us, on our data. Looking at one, we have our school map, which helps them to cluster school to the health units, and they have those programs at school. And then secondly, also, when times come for immunization, the school is a public place whereby people can access it easily, and they're a little bit many or more than the health centers in that. So they use the schools as the immunization centers for them. So when they come, we provide them with the maps and to see how to cluster them and the school within the parish, which are there. And then also we have transfer of teachers, the teachers' pupil ratio. At the end, every time we would like to see how many schools basing on their numbers and how do we allocate these resources properly. We don't want other school to be with more and less. We have to balance it up. So we are using this data to ensure that we have that service delivery given equally without bias. The next one is we have examination results analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, I love this part because I'm examination secretary in Gulu City. So I have learned a lot from this system to analyze our results and give it at the end of every year. Even we have our internal examination, we call it mock. We normally analyze it properly, basing the knowledge I have got from this system of analysis. So it helps a lot and we have gone so far uh, making uh, those people to come and see how do we present our results. We have also a check uh, school list. Normally, when inspections are carried out to check on schools which are closed, open, you know, during COVID-19, a lot of schools were closed. So we were using our system to, to ensure that, okay, which schools are closed, which are still on, and which ones are upcoming. So we happen to, to work on that. And those ones which are lances and those who are not, it gives us a point so that we call them and say, okay, please take the procedure of this so that you are not out of the policy. The next one is uh, partner engagement and support. Really, our system has worked a lot day and night. Sometimes I get calls that ah, we need this data, please. I say, please, in a minute, you have it. So I have it at my hand. So we have back at Uganda during COVID-19, they were giving out mat learning materials, the audio, Oedipus, I mean, podcast, to the school and even in the community. They did this by using our map to map the school and as well as map the community and group uh, the school and attach teachers uh, to the villages or the cells which are there so that these podcasts are distributed and used at home by the learners. And then we have Pichina uh, KFW project. They came, they're in. Uh, they use our data to also provide uh, sanitary uh, facilities to our schools by fencing them, providing water, toilet system. And at the moment, they are in the batch of providing uh, uh, water to Gulu system from Gulu City, uh, from Karoma up to Gulu City. So. In order to do that, you know, water with the sanitation is very close. They worked on that using uh, these data that we have. Geneva Global also did their part. They were looking at children from six to nine years who are out of school, they drop out of school. So we use these data from school 
so that they go to the community and find out to mobilize the parents to bring those kids back. So that those kids, are, they take one year for three classes, primary one, two, three. Meaning in a timely basis, you have to learn one class like that. And then later you are promoted. They have a speed school program. We have uh, another program by you said, it is on about uh, IGRA, which is, it deals with the reading and then phonics. You know, we have been having challenges on that. So they came in and we have to give them the data of the school and the class at these schools for easy support for this school and as well as allocating the teachers who are supposed to handle those uh, projects and more so to teach, to train the teachers at the school level. Another one, the health department, we use this one. I think this one is in 2020 for distribution of nets because the health department, they came to us and said, we, we don't have data, but we would like to distribute this net to these kids. So, okay, here is the data. Please go and give it. And the nets were distributed to all the learners in Gulu City, especially more so on in the government schools. Um, the last one is, you know, Gulu in its background has been in war for decades. There's a lot that is needed on the mindset. Strong Mind Uganda came in to provide a mental health to schools, to teachers, because they know teachers also have a lot, as well as the learners. So they are in, they're using our data to make sure that how can we provide this service to the learners, to the teachers, even to the parents to access this. And they're moving school, uh, home, school, home, school, home, so that these services are provided to, the, to them. We have uh, the last one there, research. We have a lot of institutions which are carrying out research using our data, especially the aggregate data. The disaggregated data, the male and female, they want to, the number of teachers in that, the normal inflow of that to come and get this information of which we have those institutions which are in there and more others are there to come in for that. What have we learned out of this, ladies and gentlemen? When we looked at that, we said there's need for a clear policy. We know it is a new, a, a new project coming in. We need to streamline things so that it fits within, especially to mitigate those uh, uh, reporting issues, and then especially with the private school. You know, uh, in, in Uganda, our private schools, they do, they tend to be on their things while the government school do what the government like. So we are trying to see that this one should be brought in so that they uh, comply with that. There is also still need for capacity building. As I said, on technology is coming. We need time and again not to sleep. We have to ensure we still need that. Then there's need for data officer. For example, I'm a head teacher. I'm supporting the department because I know the needs of data as an administrator. So at the moment, we are volunteering. So we need this one to be in place so that the structure itself, I remember last year we tried with uh, the, the, the planning department so that this structure should be put in the system like that one of health. But we are still moving on, we are still advocating for so that these structures are there. We are looking forward for lobby so that we build up a system or a family that can support this initiative so much. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, those are uh, our education officer. His message is there. Please, you can read when the slide is given to you. Yeah. Uh, this is me, a happy me. Uh, with the education, I feel now happy because I'm using my data and I'm comfortable. Anyone who would like to use my data is welcome.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, or am I ahead of time? Good morning. I am Sidi Ahmed Jalo from the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education in the Gambia and also a PhD at the University of Oslo here. I'm studying education and management information systems. So, so my um, my presentation is going to be a little bit high level um, from miles. And I feel um, that um, thanks to the, um, the plenary guys, I don't really need to go into the background of what I need to because I think they have given us the context of what we need for this presentation because it's so high level. And I'm just going to go deep into exactly what are we doing here. And I'm going to start with exactly what do we mean when we say the image shift in the Gambia. This is something that we've been asked so many times and something that we have to explain over and over again. And maybe this time it's better that I show you. So that is supposed to be a circle here, sorry. So this is supposed to explain our annual MS cycle that starts with the production of the data, the data collection in November um, with a provisional release down there at the bottom in February and then the release in May. So as we speak, the 31st of May, we have just released our latest uh, yearbook. And that counts as part of all of these yearbooks that you have seen down in the ground. So and on an annual basis, for, the, for more than 10 years, we have been consistently, as a country, being able to produce this data at this, at this level. And also, we have been able to provide something like a report, a sort of a feedback that goes back to the schools to give them a snapshot of you know, their um, numbers as against the numbers of the other districts. And as we have been going through these processes along the years, we have also been getting more efficient, and we've been having a little bit more time and we were able to also institutionalize a, a, a summarized version of this yearbook. So this first yearbook contains a lot of tables that goes down into the specific details, but we also um, have this annual summary that also try to explain some of the key points, some of the key highlights from each of the um, tables. So um, along the way, we have getting so um, also for the past, let's say seven years now, we've been consistently doing this. But like any person, uh, like any system, emergencies, they just, they don't bring out new problems in most scenarios. They just throw light on some of the existing problems that we are having and bring them to the fore. And that's exactly what happened in our, um, in during the COVID period. Like every other sector, we also had our own emergencies. And in this education sector, we were able to, use the data that we have it to be able to project and model the various cases the various scenarios that needs that to be that the education system needs to adjust to for example when we were closed abruptly it was time to reopen after two after more than, more than one year of closing we needed to plan we needed to ensure that the students go back to school safely and a way to do that was to say that um we need to ensure that um we don't go back to full class size because of the COVID safety, we need to go down to um, uh, maybe reduce to um, 25 per class due to the social distancing. And we as a country, we were able to, from this data that we are collecting, we are able to model and to not only know how many of these classes would be, would be needed, but the infrastructures, the number of additional teachers that need to be trained, the financial constraints, and everything related to this motion, which to most part was very relevant in helping us um, adjust to um, the reopening situation. But just to show you the level of detail that we went to in this model, we were able to model to the specific school, the scenario of the specific schools. Because to um, split your class size in, into two is not an easy fit for many schools, especially if you go to big schools that are so so heavy in terms of enrollment. So we were able to identify 
out of all the scenarios, the ones that we asked to double shift, the ones that we asked to triple shift, and the complex scenarios, schools that really none of these solutions meet, and we need to take special attention to them, we've been able to identify them, list them, and also take specific approaches that are related to them. So this is how well we were able to you know, work with the data that we have. But during this time, we also realized that we did not know the first thing. We, not, we knew almost everything about the school, but we did not know the first thing about the students themselves. Because when it was time to reopen, the one last bit that happened was we were supposed, how were the children going to travel to go to school? In a, in a country, in a context where even the public transport is social distance and the student cannot compete, younger ones cannot compete with the older ones. So the ministry said, we need to get public buses. The Ministry of Finance said, yes, we can give you public buses, but how much do we need? We go back to the data and we don't know exactly where these children are coming from. So there's no way in hell we were able to estimate exactly how much of these buses that we do. And because of that, we missed another six months of learning because we were unable to safely take the children back to school. And that is why um, when we talk about the MSF, this is the things that we are getting into when we talk about in the Gambia. And this has been something that we have been um, institutionalized in our policy. The policy has been asking for since 2016 when we revised it. And that is why when we met with the DHIS2 um, uh, system in 2018, it was at the time when we were also looking back at um, our own systems and trying to um, change, looking for systems, looking for processes, looking for ways to make sure that we make this dream a reality. So what was the plan in 2016 when we said we were going to shift? We knew that collecting individual data is not something that is um, easy to do. It's something that we need to, um, it's very detailed and it's something that needs to be done at the lower level. So for one, we said we this needs to go down to school base level. And this is first of my two presentations and the other presentation is, go, is also going to go into the use cases of how we've used the HISO. But just to show that also one of the failings that we have in our ME system was the data that we had. We were able to model all this at the national level but nothing at the regional or school level. So we have not been prepared for them. And this is one way of us approaching them, trying to go to ensure that we are now changing our focus from the national level to the um, district level, regional level, and up to the school level. And these are all the components is in the slides. You can read through later, but this is sort of the kind of plan that we talked about. Specifically, also not forgetting about the teachers, making sure that um, the teachers are also considered in, in this. But as everyone is always saying, you know, moving to individual is not going to be a, a day's change. It is something that we have to, you know, take one step at a time. It's not a sprint like many of us are taking it to be. We need one system and the system needs to come and then we would enroll all the students, all the schools, and then we would have a successful, you know, you know, story. That's not how it's going to happen. And since 2016, we have been going through this um, story. We have been going through this um, journey and we've realized that every step that you take along the time matters and doing it properly matters even more. So, um, so far we've been able to, um, following the project, the implementation, we've been able to, um, um, from the learnings from COVID, we were able to use the HIS2, the tracker program specifically, to enroll students in what we call a, na a national um, census exercise that collected individual data for all the students we have in our country. The Gambia is not big, but I would, you know, spare you the details. You know, we will talk about that later, but something that is possible in our context. And then we did that and we were able to, let's say, in case another emergency like COVID comes, we would for sure be able to say now that yes, in this specific locality or in this specific school, these are the number of students that we are coming from this area um, in, in 2019, and probably this is how much they are now. And um, after that, we had our own challenges, which will also go back into, you know, in the use case section as we, we will discuss in the other presentation. We also introduced this school-based system, the plan that we showed through this semis that has been, you know, introduced um, during the plenary. And these are all, you know, approaches, these are all things that we've been trying to, to implement. And we did this in just recently, February 2024. 
And it showed a lot of promise, but again, we will not go into details. We will also show that at use case. But the most important thing that we are, uh, that I want to talk to you about in this is the, the, the kind of supporting structures that we, um, that we had to rely on in order to make this um, at least even real realizable. Because first thing first, politically, um, the Gambia is, is um, lucky to have a stable political environment which translates to a stable ministry, which is why once you are able to convince um, the sector to be able to do something, and we have been able to internalize it in policy, it is easy for us administrators to continue and you know do the work as structures. But we still need policy and legal structures to allow us, like someone was saying, there's ethical issues that are associated with collecting individual data, and we don't have that kind of backing right now. And there are other sort of, sort of you know support for the MS itself that are not forthcoming from the Gambia because we don't have an MS, you know, you know, budget line or anything. So we are still, you know, we scramble here and there trying to find resources in order to do this. But they realize how important it is, but it is not yet at the um at, at, at the legal level. Uh we talked about how the importance of the software. We will talk about that also in the use case. Sorry for referring to the uh, the second presentation because it has the use cases. And then talk about devices infrastructure and also talk about connectivity. So um, these are all things that we have been able to, you know, try to play it. As you can see in this screen, we have a router and we have a, uh, a device that is procured by the, by the ministry to be able to support data processing at the school level. And this router, the reason why it is there is to see a very low cost way that we have come up as a ministry to provide um, connectivity to this at least those two pilot schools, which is easily scalable because it's based on a um, VPN solution that is costing a tenth of what internet costs supposed to be in, in the country. And it's only as supporting data processing at the level of the school. And it has made this implementation for the school-based SIM 10 times easier than it was supposed to be with, with, with internet. Then we talk about you know material funding you know and the importance of research. My PhD program is a big part of this as um, we are learning to the journey and then you know uh, we've been throughout the process informing and working with the the lab to ensure that all of these learnings, all of these things that we are finding from the fields are also incorporated into um, incorporated into the uh, the. Uh, the the production and the development of the of the tool then you know continuous you know human development both in terms of project capacity in terms of academic trainings but most of it importantly in terms of you know university collaboration like you know uh, sophia started to mention because shifting to an individual based system it comes with a lot of requirements and one of those is you know huge demand for for, for human resource so we need to make sure that we have a base to, to, to rely on. You need to have not, we are not talking about data officers at the ministry level. You know, somebody has already said as that they are still struggling with that. And imagine if you go down to school and you need this sort of data processing. So we need to have a very, you know, solid way of institutionalizing this capacity building, these trainings. And we are doing that through a university collaboration with um from the University of the Gambia and University of Oslo, who have started in who have started a master's program right now that is going on at the Gambia that is supposed to you know start developing the capacities of the region of the district and then use that to also you know create capacities and expand um uh, the human resources needed at the school level. And the lessons are many. The shift is definitely possible. There's a lot of question marks, but it's definitely possible. And we should prioritize the needs of the school. Also going back to the presentations, the, the one of the reasons why the SEMIS is successful is because it is following the school processes. It is following a process, it's following the information flow and not just you know a, 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 a product that just wants to come and you know, bring an outcome. It is trying to mimic what these teachers are doing and also make sure the system helps them do that. And the student list is the foundation, maintaining and updating the student list. Because once you know one student gets missed or is not recorded, then you there's nothing else that you can do for for uh, in, in in terms of uh, for that system for the student either marking attendance or updating resources or do anything. And also we 
realize that digitalization, like many people have said, doesn't necessarily need to increase the workload. And how are we doing that is when you focus your the needs of the schools, you are trying to make sure that you are making their work easier. So digitalizing the product, the end product should be what? Saving time, saving money, saving this. That should be the goal. And if that is the goal, then you will increase the chances of you know producing uh, um, uh, produce, producing a product that would work and that could be adopted. But this is far from a list of you know things that could make it work. This is just some of our lessons. So we have way more other things that are key determinants in whether this is successful or not. So again, we have a list of um, challenges that we are uh, uh, faced with, but I'm not going to bore you with this anymore. There's a cross-cutting across almost everywhere. And um, for that, I want to say thank you and hope we, are, we see another presentation. Hello. Hi. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Okay, yes, I, I, I hear you. Good. So we have Mr. Bukpa Dumeto. Yes. Uh, that is going to present. But uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you. And then I'll do the demo. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Jerry. Uh, as Jerry said, my name is uh, Bokwa Komi Dometo. I'm the ICT Director of uh, Ministry Educational and Technical Education of Togo. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize for my English, and I hope I can make myself understandable. Uh, I would like to uh, thank all of you for this opportunity given to us to, to use uh, GHS2 to deal with uh, problems we are facing in our educational system and to uh, especially thank the his WCA team uh for their support so uh I, I can go you you see my screen yes 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 okay okay thank you so uh i'll present you uh the uh, ghs2 using to uh give results of uh, examination to people in Togo. So, uh, what is going on? Okay. Okay. If you want, you can My present your camera so we can see you too. Okay. My presentation uh, outline I will talk first about where we are coming from and what we have faced, and then uh, the problem we, we, we faced and how we managed to deal it, and then what we proposed with uh, GHS2 using, and then what benefit we get from this, and I will conclude and open the window for uh, uh, think going forward. So, uh, in our context, we can 
divided the period in two. Before 2007, all the process of uh, examination system are manual. So you can imagine uh, the, 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 the context. And then from uh, 2007 to 2023, we digitalized the, the systems. Uh, so we, we tried to <clears throat> make a publication of a result through some digitalization system, but with its problem. And we can uh, tell you that we have three examinations in uh, our primary, secondary, and technical school. And each year, about uh, 498,000 of people pass uh, their exams and need to get their results. So with this situation, what do we face? With the manual uh, consultation, uh, there is, it costs too expensive to print all the results to make a transportation from the central level to examination center through the country. And then in that context, the candidate need to travel to go to the centers and to get their results. There was, uh, uh, you can imagine, uh, a defense by distracted students. The they list uh, are not uh, available all the time. And then useless and bursted on the scoreboard. That was the situation in the manual uh, consultation. Then we go to consultation by SMS, SMS and on a GSM network. And on this, the publication system was congested. And it costs for people or citizens to get to the system. And then sometimes, it takes too long to get the, uh, the result from the request when uh, people make the request through their phone, uh, they can get the result uh, about three or four hours later. So uh, it was not uh, easier. And then for parents, it was difficult to handle this system. So we, we approach uh, his WCA to see whether they can uh, support us making easier life for people. So in two, uh, 2024, we make uh, an assumption and uh, we decided to use chatbots and QR code to make a consultation. And then here yeah, you can see we, 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 we write tests because it's the first time we'll do this and uh, next week, this is available and we'll make the test next week. And then we'll learn from that test. But why do we uh, choose this? We choose this uh, based on data, data from authority for regulation and electric communication and postal service in Togo. And this data, uh, in Togo, we have uh, 8 million of population. And from this 8 million, we have uh, 5 million and 834 people that subscribe for cell phone. And then the cell phone penetration rate is uh, uh, 75%. And also we have uh, 
about 4 million of people that sub make subscription for data, mobile data. So we are sure that with this environment, we can use easily uh, chatbots to make a consultation. And over this, we know that all the citizen, uh, 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 a critical amount of the citizen are comfortable with uh, WhatsApp. So, what will we have uh, as a benefit from this uh, proposition? The consultation with chatbot will free consultation because as you have a data in your phone, you can make a consultation freely. And then you can have a fast response. Then, then normally as you, you make the request, you get uh, back your response. And we'll test it and then we'll, we, we'll learn from that. And then it is possible to make a voice consultation. I, 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 I will talk about this uh, uh, later because we think for those people who are not uh, comfortable with uh, using a uh, phone, making a uh, voice message is, uh, I think, the best way to interact with the system. And then from the QR code consultation, we'll have a free consultation also. And then this will reduce the server congestion and it will be very easy handling for information access. So we can say that in Togo, the publication of school exam result is, has gone from manual mode with each share of problems to SMS mode, which is not without its difficulty either. And the country's cell phone penetration rate suggests that the possibility offered by smartphone can be used to reduce the problem and traditional of traditional methods. And then wouldn't the future coupling of artificial intelligence with the new consultation system pave the way for a voice consultation that would make life much easier for thousands of illiterate parents. Uh, that's what I was talking, I was talking about before. Uh, in our country, all uh, citizens that are illiterate, they are very, very comfortable with a, a voice message on WhatsApp. So if we can enable them to use data consultation to interact with the system and get the result of their sons and their, their children, this will be very, very, very easier uh, for them. So we hope uh, his WCA, WCA will uh, support us and find the, the right way to, to deal with this assumption. So uh, thank you. And then I'll give a hand to Mr. Jerry, who will uh, uh, make uh, a practice with you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Director. Oh, sorry. sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen uh, a couple of minutes. It's going to be a practical section. Okay. So I hope you have WhatsApp, all of you. Um, so um, first of all, let's start with this one. Uh, yeah. 
So start with the practice. Can you all scan this QR code? No, this is dummy data. Yeah, Kratos. Yeah, that's fine. That's Kratos. This is this is not the the. It's just for tests. Okay, so if you see Kratos, that's fine. <laughs> that's the guy. <laughs> oh, that's the server. So that's the chat. But can you all have access to that? Good. Who doesn't have access? I think most of you have. Good. <laughs> okay, so that's the, the first thing. Uh, second slide. If you're all there, I'm going to the second slide. Can I go to the second slide? Good. Okay, second slide. So this is it. So we have a workflow. We have middle school. Um, sorry, you need to interpret it, but you have this examination and then this one. Okay, so you just need to type the information and get the results. So the first one, you just have to say hi. So say hi. Morning. I don't know. Uh... No, you can say it in any language. Just say hi. It's just to start the conversation. You can be that... bonjour and. Is that... that okay? I... Have you said hi? So what is what 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 is the reply? So it's both French and English. Yeah, both French and English. Is that OK? Good. So for the English speaking uh, people, just read the English part. French, like me, read the, read the French part. Is that OK? OK, so what did you say? You said you need to type exam, isn't it? So please type exam. No, not case sensitive. The QR code? OK, I'm going back to the QR code. Have you typed exam? What's the next instruction? OK, so let's go back here. It's this one, the third one, back A. Huh? So choose three, for instance. Have you, choose, have you chosen three? Three for everyone? Okay. Good. So what else? Have when you chose three, what did it ask again? Technical or general? Okay, in this case they all went general, so just pick general. Two is general, isn't it? Are you all there? Good. So now if you pick general, what was the next question? The last name. As a football fan, you can choose Mila. I will choose Mila. Yeah, your table name, number of table, that's the identification. So it's uh, two, 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 yeah, two, five times. Is that okay? Simple. Is that okay? Have you done that? So yes, what do you see? Yeah, Roger Mila, isn't it? You got the result? Yeah, it's, is that okay? Good, you can try another one. Try another one, okay? Don't try this one. This one is it's a trick. Don't try this one. <laughs> it's a trick. <laughs> is that, is that, yeah, don't try this one, <laughs> okay? It's just to show that you don't necessarily have results. It doesn't to go and query if it doesn't see it, it's like no result. Is that okay? Okay, so you can choose Smith as well. So that is for this one, okay? Have you tried it all? Who has not been able to do that? So just say hi and you come back. 
or just put in bonjour, or you can just you can miss bye. <laughs> Is that okay? So you can try another one. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay okay so this let's let's just say that um in this case we made it in such a way that you need to put the name and the identification why because we say it's private data and we didn't want people to have like the possibility to just type a random number and get someone's data is that okay but we also needed to strike the right balance because we don't have to have a lot of information before having the results. So we said, first of all, surname, and then the identification number. We assume that with those things, you can quickly get your result, okay? So that's the way it's going to react, okay? Now, we're going to go back to saying hi again. Say hi, I mean, start the whole process again. Say hi. Now we're going to choose the other exam. If you realize when you say hi, you tap, you tap exam, then you have three, three exams, isn't it? Choose the second one. The first one is not available because we haven't, it's just to show you that when we're going to have it for the, the for Togo, the, because it's going to be this weekend that you're going to experiment it, the exams are not available, will not be, they will just tell you that that exam is not available. Okay, so choose two. Have you chosen two for the exam? Is that okay? For that one, it's simple. Just type the, the table number. So for instance, you can type 55551 and you get the result. Just to show you that you can have different workflows depending on the country's demand. Okay? Is that okay? So you get just the result just by typing the ID. Is that okay for everyone? Good. So that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Great. All right. Oh, yeah. Really? Well, I just tested it, but I have the results. Maybe they removed it, but it's fine. They got it? Really? Hello, Jerry. Oh. Merci, Monsieur Demetto. Oh, OK, merci à vous aussi. Et donc, je, je, je peux, je peux m'éclipser parce que je suis appelé à d'autres tâches là. Merci, bonne journée. <laughs> merci. All right. OK, thank you so much. Okay, so hello again, everyone. I kind of, I'm assuming everybody was in the plenary earlier. Yeah. Is everybody from the education sector? No? So cool to have you. <laughs> um, so I'm here uh, to tell you about some of the work we're doing at IAP. It's uh, oh, closer. Mm. Um, and so actually, I might be one of the few people here that doesn't really use DHS2. Uh, the work that we do is pretty agnostic uh, in the sense that it can be used by anyone. Uh, we do, um, uh, our mission, as I mentioned earlier, is this one, but we really want to support every government in reaching SDG4. You all know that this is about uh, quality education. But I always say that it's reaching SDG4 by way of SDG16, strengthening institutions, and 17 partnerships. And so the work uh, that we do, um, that I'm going to present today is uh, made in my team, the data and evidence team. And I'm going to show you just a few things and then we're going to do a deep dive in a, a specific tool. Um, we heavily use geospatial data. So I was super happy to see Scott showing the map, um, uh, the map analytical uh, analytics tool. Uh, everything that we produce is free open source uh, based, so softwares, data, open science, everything is replicable, uh, or as Kristen would say, domesticable, anywhere. 
uh, and customizable the way you want. Um, one of the issues that we have in education and that you also have in health uh, is about uh, locating people, right? Uh, locating people, so having special population estimates is an issue. Uh, in, in education, we, we don't really uh, have a useful way to use uh, population uh, by five-year age groups. It doesn't make sense. Uh, no education system is based from zero to four and then five to nine. I mean, it doesn't make sense. So that's why we developed this tool that you can uh, use um, that actually use the special population estimates from WorldPop that you can adjust to your own national population estimates and that, that you can split by single years of age. Once it's split by single years of age, you can calculate specific indicators like uh, access or transfers, uh, but you can also regroup these population estimates by the actual population intervals that you need for your education system. Uh, this, uh, we've, well, the code is on GitHub, GitLab. Uh, it's also uh, a work that we do in collaboration with WorldPop. So if you go on their webpage, you will see the whole page for the African uh, countries and territories to uh, just download your data sets. Uh, I didn't mention that the, the, the scale at which we work is 100 square meter, so it's relatively small. Um, in education, it makes sense because we have catchment areas that are pretty small around the schools. Uh, perhaps in health, you can just work with one kilometer grids, I don't know. Um, but for us, it's really important to have like very small estimates. Um, another, based on this work, what we do in uh, emergency context or crisis context is that we use satellite imagery of, let's say, floods. This is in Madagascar. Um, and so we kind of overlap the population estimates, the school locations, and the crisis or hazards or events so that we can actually support the ministry in addressing specific areas first. Of course, when there's a flood or cyclones, you need to cover your whole territory, but you can focus uh, using this, uh, these models and these uh, geospatial data. We heard yesterday uh, and the day before catchment areas. Uh, for us, also in education, it's super important to have uh, catchment areas that are really providing us insights of actual access to education. And so we work with our little grids. We use, uh, again, uh, either national, so official data or uh, when they're not available for open source data uh, to actually uh, look at travel time to school. And so we do it kind of the reverse way. So we start from the school and then we calculate how, how long it takes to walk on the paths and the trails and the different roads until we f we get to certain milestones. So like these are by 15 minute walks. Uh, this is in Togo also. <laughs> um, and so this is, this is cool because uh, you can combine these catchment areas that are based on very precise information with buffers that we typically use in health, I believe, um, so that you can actually see the, the kind of theoretical coverage of your education system, but the actual access. And so that allows decision makers to make proper decisions about, you know, should you build a new school or should you have a transportation scheme uh, and things like that. We do also support countries for evaluating the um, the programs that they have in place. So this is uh, a, a, an evaluation you made in, in Colombia to see how the school, the grants given by the governments to schools for supporting school meals were having an impact on actual learning uh, scores. And so having these uh, uh, geographically weighted regression models allows you to see where your programs have more impact. And so then it allows you to prioritize and funnel the funds uh, differently. And then another model that was used in a neighboring country in Finland uh, is about uh, optimization of school in inspection routes. Because we know in our countries that uh, school in inspections are important, but there's a lot of schools, very few inspectors. And so optimizing the routes, it's like delivery for, delivery for schools, right? So we're trying to find the best possible uh, trajectory that an inspector can, can um, take to visit more schools more frequently and then bring back the results to the, um, the MS. Um, I, I forgot to mention that uh, all the models that you see are pretty data light. Uh, we don't want people in a ministry having the computers being crashing all the time. So we try to focus on you know very light uh, data requirements. Um, everything is made to be deployable everywhere uh, at any administrative level in any country. And at IAP, we provide uh, what I call 360-degree support. It means that we, we have a narrative, so we have a, a document that explains you know, the theory and the research behind the models. But we also have uh, YouTube videos that shows how to use the model. We provide coaching. We provide actual training, in-depth training, face-to-face uh, -face or online. And um, 
and all the codes are uh, available uh, on GitHub. We, you can fork it uh, to your own links. But the model I wanted to show you in detail today is the one that we just published a few weeks ago. Uh, you can find the, the document with all the links to the data, to the codes at uh, that URL. <clears throat> and for, bon, I'm, I don't know how familiar we, are, we all are with these MCDA models, but the idea is to use as many relevant criteria as possible, weight these criteria, and then use these, these the results, the outputs, uh, to make uh, good decisions. I didn't put a QR code, but I should have. I see that <laughs> it's working well here. Uh, maybe I should put it back. Got okay. Uh, you you will ha uh, you all have access to the slides anyway. So um, the the well, it looks a bit complicated like this, but it's basically uh, it's a model that goes into step. Um, climate is a super um, it's a trendy topic, but it's also a, a kind of um, context in which we will have to live uh, in the future. Uh, also, infrastructure from a ministry is the most important uh, expense in capital. Uh, we have the salaries, the teacher salaries, of course, that are recurrent, but for investing in the system, infrastructure is the most important budget um, uh, post. So that's why we, we need uh, as early as possible to be able to see um, not only where are the most suitable locations to build new schools for the future, but we also need to see for today, for the existing schools, uh, in which context they, they are built and if their characteristics are actually suited to the location they are in. You follow me? And so we have this model where we, we will combine uh, hazard risk layers, so uh, layers of information, with uh, a hazard index that uh, we'll go in detail in a second. And then we can actually combine this with uh, economic uh, factors, social factors, the national norms, the policies uh, of the ministry, and then um, uh, uh, get some type of heat map for site suitability. And then you combine the points for their school locations, and then you can assign a risk uh, index to each of the schools. So when we talk about economic suitability, I gave examples here. This is a model we just applied in Togo, actually, with the Ministry um, uh, and the Department of Planning. And so uh, in, if you look at the norms and in, in policies in the ministry, uh, I guess I'm assuming just like is in hell, you would have requirements that schools cannot be um, super close to a, a street, for example, or you, you would have uh, any building, actually in Togo, in any building cannot be closer to X uh, number of meters from the street. So it's same, same for schools. Uh, in Togo, they have a norm also that a school cannot be, um, uh, I can't remember the actual number of meters, but uh, so close to, uh, to a market or to a church. And so you have to take these factors into account. Same for waterways. You need to be close to a water point, but not that close so that your school gets flooded. <laughs> Oops, sorry, here we are. Um, uh, environmental suitability. We talk about hazard index. So there, there are uh, indices um, computed locally in many countries, but there's also an international source for that is the INFORM index. Who's familiar with the INFORM index? So it's basically a global index calculated with different uh, types of uh, uh, variables that give you an idea about, you know, uh, how how is uh, uh, the situation in the context? You know, what are the hazards? What is the vulnerability of the place? And how is resilient uh, the how resilient is the is the location? We combine this with items that are relevant to the context. So here we in the model for Indonesia we have the forest and desert cover. Uh, we have the slope. Uh, in um, in uh, the model in, in Indonesia, we use also volcanoes, earthquakes, because these are prone areas. If I were to use this model in my country, Canada, uh, volcanoes don't make sense, um, earthquake neither. So that, that would not be customized, customized the same way. And then for uh, social stability, uh, this, uh, this is the, the alert. So I guess we don't go to the secret room. Yeah. We're safe. <laughs> OK. Exactly. So, so it would be interesting to look at what variables are in there so that we can pop in the model. And so basically, social suitability is that what makes a location suitable from a social point of view. So I talked about you know the proximity to, uh, to bars or to churches, um, but also the, the population density. 
um, in, in national norms, you will have requirements to, to build a new school. You need to have a, a certain number of people that would be technically attending the school. And so that's uh, data that you can put in. What is interesting with the model is that you can actually weight each of these um, components in different ways. Uh, not only e each uh, uh, big component, but each of the subcomponents too. So if it's more important for us to be close to a water point, then we can increase the weight for water points and then decrease the point, uh, the, the, the value for the distance to the road. So it's extremely customizable. And when we talk about norms, well, this is the type of norms that we have in a, uh, in a ministry. So when we look at this Aceh province in Indonesia, I did a little kind of zoom here uh, to, sh to show that the pixels are like, extremely small. Um, we can layer then economic suitability. We can layer also our hazard index, combine it with uh, other elements of environmental suitability. And then the social suitability, um, the, looking at population distribution and so forth. And then you have a complete model. So that complete model shows you where it would be more or less suitable to build a new school. So basically, if you were to select a location, of course, you would take into account politics, <laughs> other elements, uh, but at least data from the model would inform you or where would be uh, where would be the most suitable location. When you uh, actually input the school, the existing school locations, you can then assign for each school a value. And then uh, it allows you to also check into your uh, your MS, sorry, and then look at your MS data and see for the, that type of infrastructure that is located in a flooded area. Well, is it built on stilts? Uh, is there waterproof uh, boxes where you can store the textbooks and so forth? And so combining both MS data with climate data with national norms and standards allow you to have this kind of uh, school maintenance plan or school development plan or uh, in Ethiopia they call it school improvement program uh, where you can actually have very precise and very uh, agile, some would say, um, uh, infrastructure management. And that's it for me. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't mention it, but but perhaps I mean for us it would be super interesting to see how we can turn these models into apps. I guess that's name in the HS2. Um, but it would be super interesting to see if it can be useful also in your context. So. Thank you so much, uh, really, uh, Amelie, and to all the speakers. It was an absolute pleasure, and it's it's really refreshing to get a, a new perspective in as well. So really appreciate you being here with us uh, this week. So time is up. Um, I think some of you have meetings. Some of you have lunch. Uh, for those of you who maybe have a question or two, if there's anything burning, please feel free to, to stay, uh, and we can take a question or two. But our time is actually officially up. So we might have to meet in the hallways. Thank you so much, everyone. At one o'clock, we come back for a session specifically dedicated to um, individual level data with the SEMIS app, more, more in depth.